welcome to the webinar, The State of the Attention Economy. It's a very first co-production between FIA, the Associatie of AV Media, and Screenforce. She's a renowned speaker on uh, media research and attention all over the globe. She has her own media research company. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, we are very pleased to announce the leading lady of attention, Karen Nelson Fields. Thank you. This is uh, very exciting for me to be here. Um, I have been writing for a UK publication called MediaTel for close to 12 months now, and I thought that perhaps the best thing for me to talk through tonight was to give you a bit of a year in review. So that's the context of my, of my presentation. Um, so, you know, I'm going to talk through some of the topics in the Oh, unfortunately, my clicker hasn't uh, registered. <laughs> so perhaps someone could click on the next slide for me. Thank you. Um, so, so let's just start and give you some context. So, you know, attention is perhaps um, the most, um, I guess, generous force, ge generous form of, 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 of their time um, at all. And, and, you know, humans really struggle to, to pay attention. So we live in this constant state of zombie. So, you know, most marketers actually have the wrong notion of uh, how much attention is paid to advertising. And it's certainly not sustained and undivided, which is, is what most marketers are hoping for. So when I talk about living in a constant state of zombie, I mean that, you know, we, we have lives and, and, you know, we're busy. And, you know, again, we, we don't sort of constantly pay attention to ads. Next slide. So it's, it's more like this, um, you know, we, we kind of do this kind of switching thing where, you know, even though for 30 seconds of the ad might be on screen, um, we switch between active, passive and non-attention. And active attention is when we're looking straight at an ad and paying attention, um, even if for a fleeting second. Passive attention is when you're, in the case of TV, dual screening or talking, co-viewing, or in the case of mobile, when you are, um, you know, looking at the screen around you. And then non-attention is the obvious when you're talking, you know, to your friends when, when you're on mobile or when you've gone out and made a cup of tea. So this switching, essentially, the more switching means more distraction. And, um, you know, where, again, we would think that time on screen might be the uh, measure of human engagement, you can see that there are many gaps within that. And this therein lies the first problem, the gap between what our current currency is, which is, you know, the MRC sort of uh, viewable standard and what actually attention is paid. And this gap is vast. So what we know is that, you know, at any one time around 70 to 75% of the online ads that you buy uh, against the currency you trust um, is actually not delivering you the value you think they do. And, you know, that, that's a, a pretty massive gap. Um, and that's the problem that we as a business are, are trying to solve for. Um, we also know that platform functionality is perhaps the largest contributor of this distraction. So, you know, high scrollable formats, for example, drive more distraction, which makes complete sense if you think about how you, you view yourself. Um, we also know that general page clutter causes a lot of distractions, so particularly away from ads because, you know, you're reading the content or you're interacting with friends and family. Um, so, you know, and that, that's research that I've done years ago, even on generalised formats. So any sort of clutter, any page clutter around the ad causes um, distraction and, and uh, makes the ad less impactful. And then we know that also total ad visibility plays a role in the amount of distraction as well or the amount of attention if you want to look at it the other way. So I've, I've talked about this before um, in your region, but two things determine total ad visibility. And one is the obvious, which is ad pixels, so the proportion of an ad that is on screen, but also this thing called screen coverage, which is about the proportion of the screen that the ad covers. And if you think about the proportion um, as a total, that's how we measure um, you know, how much attention or how much distraction may or may not be paid. The other thing that's really important to note, um, and we collect this data, is the sound. Um, you know, and we get a lot of TV broadcasters talking to us about the importance of sound, and we completely know that sound is important. But when sound is a default off, it actually is easier for someone to sort of switch past an ad. Um, and we, we, we know that, you know, this would all be manageable in terms of the the problem we face with the currency, if, if all platforms 
and all formats behave the same, but they don't. So if this error, if you like, around the viewability standard or around, you know, um, distraction, for example, was the same, it would be easy for us to just sort of add a layer in, but it's not the same and this is the problem. Um, we know that sound differs quite significantly by platform and we know that you know, some have a high sound on as a default and then the volume is low or high. Um, we also know that this viewability gap, which you spoke of, differs quite significantly by platform and by format. So the amount of attention that you gain by format can differ within even single platform. We also know that platforms and formats display different amounts of switching, which is what this graph is. So how many times you switch between active and passive is very, very different by platform and by format. Um, we also know that the, you know, the, the nature of um, scrollability has a very large uh, impact on how quickly you lose attention or attention decay, I should say, and that varies quite considerably by platform. And then there's this new thing which I've been just sort of looking at more recently, which is this thing called attention elasticity. And attention elasticity is essentially the range of attention that a platform sort of affords you. So if you think about the attention seconds possible, each platform and each format is bound by this thing called attention elasticity. Um, and lower attention platforms also have smaller boundaries, if you like. And this has a massive impact on the ability for your creative to actually move beyond that. Um, so that in itself, um, I've just written a paper on that through WARC. Have a bit of a look at that. It's quite, it's quite interesting and systematic. Um, we also know, as I said, that this um, range impacts creative strategy. So what this means is your creative has little chance to perform outside of this norm. And what I've just I've written another paper for MediaTal about the chicken or egg concept, which is which comes first, creative or platform. And what we can see from years of data and, and dozens and dozens of groups is that, you know, the same creative performs very differently and worse or better in line with the overall platform attention performance. And what that means is if creative was dominant, you know, brand A, you'd see seven seconds on platform A, platform B, platform C and platform D, but you don't. You see this constant systematic decay in the amount of attention seconds across different formats and across different platforms. And that's consistent across many, many platforms and many sets of data. So, you know, that has huge implications around, you know, just building amazing creative and expecting it to work really well because this norm um, it is kind of expected across different formats. So basically, um, you know, the negative news is that this undermines our entire currency, which is what I was saying before. It's, it's the relativity of an impression that we're having problems with. And it's not just the obvious. So often people talk about, you know, reach and frequency being the thing, not all reach is equal, which is in fact something that I started with many years ago. But what I know now is this impressions more broadly, which has a flow on effect to any measurement system, you know, mental availability model, you know, market mix modeling or any sort of concept, share of voice, any sort of concept that relies on equitable impressions will fail. And we're seeing that a lot in things like share of voice, share of market modeling, um, you know, the decline in brands around mental availability. So this whole currency problem that we face is quite systemic across a lot of things in, in our industry. Um, for example, we just started to see some double jeopardy effects um, with attention. So lower attention platforms drive less mental availability for you and disproportionately more mental availability for your competitor. So if you know anything about mental availability, it's, it's kind of the gold standard, if you like, of brand strength. And, you know, the more people that think of your brand more often at the category purchase occasion um, will obviously mean that you're a bigger brand. But, you know, lower attention platforms uh, are meaning that your mental availability is not only you know, not growing, but in part it's declining. So there's a real issue with this impression um, inequitable um, issue. We also know um, that, you know, what we've been using from a currency perspective is 
a lot about inward facing. So I call it the difference between inward facing and outward facing. So inward facing data is, is metadata like scroll speed, ad length, time on screen. But none of those things really reflect human behaviour. So scroll speed could just be a function that you're trying to not, you know, make it go dark. And in the meantime, you're, you're talking to your friends. Ad length means nothing. And ad length, we showed you before, that it could actually mean that you're reading the content, not looking at the ad, or talking to your child and not looking at the ad, and time on screen equivalent. But yet they are the typical metrics that are used to determine how, you know, how effective essentially your ad is from a, from a currency perspective. So this is kind of, um, I wrote a paper on um, the evolution, if you like, of viewability to what I call outward facing attention measurement. So thinking about what I've just said, so inward facing is things like viewability version one, which was the original MRC standard, which is, you know, 50% pixels in two seconds of time. But inward facing as well is viewability version two, which is sort of around at the moment. So there's there's a lot of assumed advanced human behaviours. But again, we know that, you know, scroll speed um, doesn't relate to actual human behaviour. And then, you know, for you that, you know, obviously your, your um, country is very much uh, connected to attention economy, there's a whole nuance of, of organisations that are building out attention proxies. But really they're a bit of a bit of um, inward facing and maybe a single instance of human data. So there's a whole, um, I guess, industry that's kind of halfway between viewability and human attention, which is continuous outward facing human attention. So this is kind of how the industry is rolling. And, you know, that number four, continuous human attention data is what is gold standard. And that is actually looking at outward facing through camera or the devices, uh, the camera on different devices. So on TV, on your PC, on your mobile, you know, cinema, we've just finished, you know, outdoor, et cetera, understanding how humans actually interact with media. And that's the most gold standard. So TV attention is something that we have been uh, working on for quite a number of years. Um, and what we do is we send little tiny cameras out to the home. And this is actually uh, the camera model looking, you can see all the data points there, looking at the room and sort of understanding if people are looking directly at the TV or whether they're talking to each other or if they've left the room and whether they've returned. Um, what we do know about TV um, is that it is a lot more consistent in terms of attention than some of the high scrollable formats. So the proportion of people watching at the very beginning of an ad is a lot more constant um, and, and so the distribution is flatter. So they almost watch the same at the second half of the ad. You know, there's switching in between, but in terms of the numbers, there's no scrollability. So you're still getting the same amount of reach from one end to the other. And we see that also on cinema um, and we see that on some of the quality digital uh, video plays, but not all of the them. <laughs> I won't name them. Um, and what we know is that putting longer ads on scrollable online platforms actually doesn't give you more attention as such. It just gives you more wastage. So meaning longer ads don't give you more active attention. But this is very different on television. So, you know, putting longer ads on TV definitely gives you more actual active attention because it's directly related to non-scrollable and the nature of the platform. So that's exciting for those in TV. Um, we also know as we move forward into the second year of writing all of these papers, and this is the second year of where we're headed, that individual level data is um, helping us to understand the really complicated um, connection between active attention and passive attention. So we know passive attention is important. Um, and certainly in TV, you know, the, when the distinctive assets are present and, and, and sound is on, there's definitely a, 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 a complicated interplay. So understanding individual level data is a really big part of our future, that's for sure. Um, and how people interact and, and, and um, you know, scroll between the two or, you know, look between the two different types of attention. 
Um, I was asked to also explain that, you know, recently um, we've just started to build out an attention model. You might have seen some of the press in Australia. and It's actually going to be rolled out into New Zealand and UK really soon. Um, but, but cinema is very similar in, in that sense that it's a much more flatter experience, which you would expect because you're locked in. And the fun police will come and tell you off if you're on your mobile. So there's there's very little distraction, if you like, in a cinema screen. So that's really exciting for the business and exciting for the future of attention trading. Um, we've also literally just about to build out a model for outdoor. We're starting with outdoor furniture. So all of this data will be normalised to active attention, passive attention and non-attention so that everyone can understand the relativity across different platforms. Um, so the opportunity to see an ad is very, very important. Um, and as I said, outward facing measurement, which is actually about humans, is super important to understand if a, if a human is actually watching. And that's where the industry is headed, definitely. So some big takeouts from us um, for you to take home and do some homework. Um, understand how the flow and effects um, of inequitable impressions might impact your business. And like I said, it's not just reach and frequency planning. Think about your market mix modelling. Think about your budgeting. Think about your creative planning um, because inequitable impressions could be the difference between, you know, you getting more share of voice or your competitor getting more share of voice or um, dirty data going into models that sort of skew results, if you like. The second piece is bad metrics bring confusion and hesitancy for change. Be fussy about proxies, um, which from an attention council perspective, I'm really fussy about. So, you know, if we are going to move towards really good quality data um, and attention, which is real humans, not uh, modelled, if you like, be super fussy about the sorts of data that you're integrating into your systems and into your plans. Um, the third piece is procurement holds all the cards and must be a part of change. Procurement love to hear me say this because essentially they have inherently been trained to think about the lowest cost. This is not what attention should be about. So, um, you know, the lowest cost of attention isn't going to give you the best quality outcomes. So be really careful to bring them along for the journey so that they understand you might have to pay more for quality. Um, the inventory might be more limited, but it is worth it because getting twice as many eyeballs on your ad is going to have much greater results than paying half the price, if you like. Um, understand how different platforms perform, no brainer, and understand how this fits into your long and short term impact. So each each campaign has its own objective. We get all of that and different platforms play a different role in that. So once you understand what to expect, so we talked about those boundaries or those norms around attention elasticity, once you actually understand what to expect, you know, you can build creative for that and you can use different formats um, for different objectives. So I do recognise that quite, quite significantly. Talk to your creative teams about how they might stretch attention elasticity. So what we know is there are upper and lower bounds. So the next level of that is good creative fits within that. So um, you have bad creative, it'll sit at the lower bound of that platform. If you have good creative from, you know, an attention getting perspective, it'll sit at the upper bound. So you, any kind of extra seconds you can get um, coming from good creative and well-branded creative will absolutely help, um, A, get you more attention and get your brand sold, that's for sure. And the last one is think about how uh, this new measurement actually impacts your media planning and buying. And we didn't have time to go through it today, but the two biggest use cases for um, this kind of data is obviously using it for adjusting media plans and optimising for media plans, basically a normaliser. It's pretty, pretty easy. Um, and then buying against it. So we're looking now to launch our, uh, you know, predictive buying algorithms off of the back of human um, individual level data. So, so this is going to be big for the next 12 months. So, so do look out for that from us, from lots of people. Um, and I think that's probably my big take out. So my homework for you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, Karen, thank you very much. A very interesting story as always and very hands-on as well. 
Uh, we do have uh, one question coming via the chat box. Mark Jan is asking, is the concept of attention economy, is it kind of hijacked by the advertising uh, uh, industry because it used to be a wider, uh, um, well, originally widely used? That's an excellent question. And marketers typically steal concepts from other industries. But the concept of attention economics is actually a study of inattention and its impact on social systems. So, okay. you know, anything, yeah, anything from, you know, if you pay inattention while you're driving, what's going to happen? If you pay, if there's inattention in study, like education, what's going to happen? So, yeah, marketers have hijacked it, but it is relevant because, you know, no ad, if the ad doesn't have attention, it will have very little impact or no impact, actually. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Um, you mentioned, and I know from previous presentations, that you've done your studies in many other countries like, uh, I think, Australia, UK, US, Germany. Um, can you elaborate a little bit about the, uh, how the, the, the outcome of the study, studies were used in those different countries? Sure. It's actually been 10 um, well, countries that we've done. I know it's huge. Um, <laughs> soon to be more. Um, the interest for us is to be able to generalise findings so that, you know, when we talk about these things in 20 quick minutes, they are actually meaningful and not sort of single instance. So what I will say is there are systematic similarities across the different countries with minor differences in demographics, um, but largely we do see systematic mathematical patterns, which is exciting for prediction. It means that those patterns are real and those patterns we can predict against. Okay. Okay, Karen, thank you very much. A final question for you. What is the next big thing in your quest towards the attention economy? Yeah, it was hard for me to explain it in such a short amount of time, but um, the big thing for version two of the attention economy will be to maximise this individual level data. So you were talking about cross-platform before, you know, obviously that's very much about uh, individual levels. So moving away from averages, units, scores, anything aggregated and looking at the individual level and how humans interact with media and using that data to be really accurate around prediction. When will we be able to implement something such as attention into uh, daily currency uh, measurement? A question I'm asked all the time. So at the moment, um, to the point of the panel, um, the scale, I mean, even though we've collected from 10 countries so far and we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of ad views, it's still not enough. So at the moment, I look at it as a quality layer that should be overlaid with reach and frequency and cost. Um, I'm not sure that we're ever going to get to a point where the sample is so big um, particularly given we're filming humans. Mm -hmm. um, so currency or not currency, I'm not sure there's an argument out there to say, you know, it's never going to be a Nielsen, but it's certainly going to be yeah. a quality layer. So um, we're not far though. I mean, you know, we've got so much data now. We, we have a position where we can predict and model um, from small sets of data. So give it, give it another year. And I think every, ask me back in 12 months, I think everything would be different. <laughs> Okay, thank you, uh, Karen.